My name is Tommy Chong. I'm a, a doper comedian, and I'm in here because I made a stupid joke about the bongs being the only weapons of mass destruction that the Bush administration had found. And next thing I know, I'm looking at nine months. It's locked, man. What? Oh, yeah. Let go! Let go, man! Shh. Come on, come on in. Hey, what's going on? It's a bus, man. We gotta figure out some way to get you out of here, man. Tonight, one half of Cheech and Chong is in a whole lot of trouble. That's right, you may have heard of Cheech and Chong, a comedy duo known for portraying marijuana in a favorable light. Tommy Chong's internet business might go up in smoke. Federal agents raided the active comedian's online paraphernalia store and... The U.S. attorney says Chong ran a family business called Nice Dreams Enterprises, named after one of his movies. And as the primary investor, the government says he sold more than $100,000 worth of autographed marijuana pipes and bongs over his website. Chongglass.com. Search and seizure operations involving approximately 2,000 federal, state, and local law enforcement operators are taking place at numerous locations across the country. They busted in the house and they kept saying, You're not under arrest. You're not under arrest. It was surreal. They came to the house and they raided our house with a helicopter 20 cops, 10 feds, I guess about 10 cops. Six o'clock in the morning. It was dark outside. It scared the shit out of us. Oh man, it's so fucking weird getting busted for bombs. Really? They really got me by surprise with that one. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that, when they raided my house, man, I thought they were looking for dope. I don't you know. <laughs> and when he said, that, "Do you have any narcotics in your house?" Of course, I'm Tommy Chong. <laughs> came to his house uh, in a very nice residential suburb of Los Angeles with helicopters, with dogs, LAPD, DEA, you know, it looked like uh, John Dillinger was being arrested, rousted him out of his bed in the, in the early morning hours to uh, arrest him for his bond business. I don't know what they were looking for. I don't really know what they were looking for. I mean, they found a pot of a pound of pot in our house, but, you know, and when you tell people that, they go, wow, a pound. But you know what? If you're a pot smoker, a pound is not much. You have a pound of sugar in your house, always. A pound of flour. What is a pound? It's nothing. He said, anymore, it's, well, there's some in the basement. And the guy kept running up and said, can't find it. <laughs> so I, I kind of insulted him. I think that's why I'm going to jail. Like, what kind of fucking DEA guy are you? <laughs> and he got defensive. He said, well, I don't have my dog. Well, you don't need a dog, you need fucking eyes, man. I'm all for it. I think as long as we're on code orange <laughs> and the attacks coming from not only Iraq but North Korea are imminent, the best thing we could do is bust Tommy Chong. <laughs> I mean, you realize that he, we literally have busted Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Cheech and Chong were a phenomenon of the counterculture, and because they outlasted most acts from the 1960s, almost came to define the era. Through the 1970s and early 80s, the Vato lowrider and the Mongolian hippie freak biker became the last of the anti-establishment Mohicans, subverting, questioning, and mocking authority in their pursuit of righteous happiness and the very best buds. We've always been into drugs somewhere along the line. <laughs> You know, everything, you know. You have to speak about what you know. You know? <laughs> the only thing we've never been is, like, an ex-drug user. We haven't been that yet. <laughs> we haven't reached that stage yet. Anyway. Tommy Chong and I met in Vancouver, Canada in 1969. Uh, I was delivering carpets at the time, and he was running an improvisational theater company in a topless nightclub that his family owned. We moved up to Vancouver because Tommy had had those nightclubs, and he's went to take the clubs over, and he started an improv group. Whoa. And um, we went looking for actors, and somebody told him about, you know, this funny guy, and that's when we met Cheech. Where did you two meet? I was delivering night? carpets, actually, and I got introduced to Tommy through a, a friend who was an editor of Rock and Roll magazine. 
And so he offered me $5 a week more to hang out with naked girls and get high all night uh, than delivering carpets, so I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see the girl. Yeah. The Shanghai junk where we performed was the Vancouver's first hopeless bar. And they were pasties and everything, g strings And uh, what it turned out to be at the end was uh, hippie, hippie burlesque, you know, informed with a hippie ethic, you know, peace, love, dope, with naked. I'd seen, like, Second City and the committee and people like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be a good idea if I could get the girls doing skits. I had, a, like, a lot of my um, hippie friends with long hairs and, and topless girls and uh, cheeks came yeah. along. All the other people in the group wanted to go up north and get their head together. They felt this was not cool, making money, and it wasn't the hip thing to do. So Cheech wanted, Cheech said, you know, man, I'll go down to L.A. with you. I'm, you know, I'm into making money. I'm into becoming a star. The group broke up, and then Cheech and I just stayed together. And we came down to L.A., and the audience was, you know, that stoner kind of audience. So, so then we started doing characters based on our audience. Oh, oh, hey, man, the cops are behind us. No, don't turn around, man. Just sit there and act natural. Oh, man. Hey, why don't you get rid of this stuff, okay? I can get rid of it, man. No, man, not that way. Eat it, man. Oh, man, I can't eat it. I got a whole hey, pocket full, right man. Behind us, man. When I saw him, I thought, these guys are unique. These guys are really funny. And with music or comedy, it's always, is it funny or is it good? It doesn't matter what it is. I think one of the few um, acts that was really appealing to uh, not the uh, typical kids, but the, uh, the rock and roll kids. They were one of the leaders of the counterculture movement. Who is it? It's me, Dave. Open up, man. I got the stuff. Who is it? It's me, Dave, man. Open up. I got the stuff. Who? It's Dave, man. Open up. I think the cops saw me come in here. Who is it? It's it's Dave, man. Will you open up? I got the stuff with me. Who? Dave, man. Open up. Dave? Yeah, Dave. Come on, man. Open up. I think the cops Dave's saw me. Dave's not here. What made me think I could put that on record? I don't know, but, you know, it was... It, 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 it stuck with me immediately, and the people at AM and uh, my attorney thought it was pretty much crazy. When you have such a huge culture that doesn't have anything, they don't have a spokesman, they don't have someone singing about uh, their culture, they don't have someone making jokes about their culture. I mean, if you can open that door and get to those people, it's a huge audience. And that's why we were selling millions of albums. Do you think it might be a bit of an in-joke? I mean, your humor is almost mm -hmm. completely based on, on dope. Well, dope is sex. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can't relate to that, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. and I mean, if, other than that, you know, get into religion. You know? <laughs> we broke through with material that before that uh, it just wasn't happening. It wasn't being played. It wasn't being exposed in any way. We called it hard rock comedy. What actually is the difference of being hard rock funny man? Is it got well, to do with, um, you know, dr drugs? Hard rock is when, like, if I tell you a joke and you don't laugh, I punch your face in. What's like that, is it? Um, what barnyard animal do you most identify with bachelor number three? Just a minute. I think I can answer that for bachelor number three. I would say you're a pig. Eventually we, we got play, and, uh, and they did uh, TV shows that we never thought in the beginning that they would be asked to do. There are some people who might question whether or not your material was, you know, off color. The good thing about our stuff is you can take it both ways, you know. You can? Either you get it or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> they were funny, they understood their audience, they understood the people who did like them, what they felt was funny. And they entertain them. I mean, that's, we're in the entertainment business. That, that's what we did. Now, if you want to go back and say, well, it was really a political statement, I don't know. What, what do you like so much about drugs? Drugs? I don't know. You have a lot of fun. You get high and you laugh at nothing. <laughs> and that's what Cheech and Chong are. You, know, you get high and you laugh at us. You know. It doesn't take a lot of brain. Hey, man. What? Who is 
within these shit, man. Mostly Maui Wowie, man. Yeah? But it's got some Labrador in it. What's Labrador? It's dog shit. What? Yeah, my dog ate my stash, man. I had it on the table and the little motherfucker ate it, man. Yeah? So I had to follow him around the little baggie for three days before I got it back. You mean we're smoking dog shit, man? So they did up and smoke, and it became a big hit. I mean, that was a shock to everybody, a shock. Because nobody thought that little movie was going to be a hit. It was, it, it was so cool. It was so cool. many years ago. Before that, there was Abbott Costello. Before that, there was Law and Hardy. Today, there is only Cheech and Chomp. You said you don't want to hurt anybody, but there are some people that say that by doing dope in the movies, and these kids come to the movies and they see you doing that, you're hurting those kids. Only if you take their position that drugs are, are, are bad. And we take the position that drugs, some drugs are not only uh, harmless, but are good for you. We're not the cause. We're only doing what's out there now popular. There are a lot of comedians who made fun of alcohol, like Red Skelton, who did amazing routines around alcoholism. And they were hilarious. And Tommy does those kind of routines around marijuana abuse. The side of marijuana, of people that are too high at the wrong times, or that kind of lose their perspective because they're too high, they were right on. There's a comic aspect to that. And they exposed it for the first time. But the media was happy to have that because that became an overall cliche for everybody. Well, when you're struggling as a comedian, you know, I mean, it's like a drowning man reaching for a straw, you know, or anything. Uh, you just try stuff until you find something that works. And what, what, what I mean by works, it's like, Whoa, you get, a, you get an effect from, from an audience. You know, they, they sit up and they're, they're listening and, and, and they're asking, where are you performing next? We're in Muskegon. Muskegon. That's funny, you missed it. There's a set of skis and some crutches for sale. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. Is this your weekly paper? Chong's own stipulation that we did not discuss his current legal problems. Somehow the occasional reference to him stuck in our conversation. Anyway. Underscoring that stage and screen persona differs from man himself. Chong never once said man. Chong never once said man. Tommy was on the road doing stand-up and he got very lonely because he didn't have Cheech. So he told me, asked me if I'd like to come on the road with him. Well, I said I would if I could, you know, be in the show. So he said, okay, start it. You could start just doing the intro. You know, the thing is, Tommy had me convinced that pop was legal. <laughs> we had it growing on the roof of the house. We were selling little bombs after the show. So after this incident, I realized I fucked up. I should have married Cheech. Marijuana, the king of dope, the one, the only, Mr. Tommy Charles. That is a nice being out in the free world. <laughs> 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 hey, man. <laughs> I thought if I was going to get pot, they'd be for pot. <laughs> My mom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apparently, they had been following Tommy for the last year, and um, because we had this Chong glass business, there is a law in the books: selling paraphernalia is illegal, and in two states, Iowa and um, Pennsylvania, I think it is. Here we are at a time in our history when there's really almost unparalleled assaults on our safety by 
international terrorists. And you've got John Ashcroft, who's trying to promote his moral vision of America. You know, and it started by draping the boobs on the statues in the Department of Justice. The illegal drug trade is a billion dollar illegal industry targeted on exploiting human weaknesses in order to reap billions of dollars in illegal profits. However, it's not only the sellers of the drugs themselves that are profiting from the drug trade. There's another illegal industry that is integrally linked to the drug trade. It's the drug paraphernalia business. On February 24th, 2003, the Justice Department called a press conference to announce the culmination of a year-long undercover sting operation codenamed Operation Pipe Dreams. The national sweep was instigated by an obscure U.S. attorney from the Western District of Pennsylvania named Mary Beth Buchanan. But just to give you a description of, of how this would be used, the, the illegal drugs uh, would be inserted, for example, into, into this area. Mary Beth Buchanan grew up in Roscoe, Pennsylvania, a small, all-white town 30 miles south of Pittsburgh with a population of just under 900. In her high school yearbook, she said her favorite hangout was Pizza Hut and that when she went to college, she planned on majoring in accounting. After getting her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania, Mary Beth Buchanan became a Pennsylvania State District Attorney. Then, on September 11th, 2001, United Airlines Flight 93 crashed 60 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, inside Mary Beth's jurisdiction. Her involvement in 9-11 catapulted her to prominence within the law enforcement community. Three days later, Mary Beth Buchanan was the first woman and the youngest person in Pennsylvania history ever to be named U.S. Attorney. For her first major operation, Mary Beth named Tommy Chong her number one target because Tommy Chong's entertainment career glamorized the use of marijuana. Hi, I'm Paris Chong. I'm uh, the oldest son of Tommy Chong. I've got him right here, and he's gonna be on my shoulder today. We're here at Chong Glass, which is a family business. We specialize in hand-blown glass, tobacco pipes, and water pipes for people that are over 18. What was that? No, we can't say, it's illegal to say that on video. Stop it, Dad. We had a license. We were being audited by the um, United States government. We were um, we were actually doing turning the business around. It was getting pretty good. Did he have much to do with the day-to-day -day operations at the factory? No, I mean he, his his ideas are so way out, so creative that it really inf interfered and kind of was conflicting to any kind of manufacturing or, or, or business where, there, where there's a serious, like, serious budget constraints, you know? So he wanted to make, like, a, a million-dollar bomb, you know, have it gold-plated, diamonds on it, and he wanted to, to uh, have it for... I mean, I'm serious. And he, to this day, he probably still thinks it's a great idea. He wanted to, to display it and have it and... And he, he believed that there was a market for a million dollar bomb. When we first started, we were told not to sell to Pennsylvania, Idaho, and I think two more states. I don't remember which ones they were. I remember writing orders for states, you know, like going like all fired up and then going like, wait a second, you know, after I'm getting their information going, wait, where are you? You know, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, we can't sell to your state. One guy kept calling me from uh, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And I told him we couldn't sell in the state, so he kept calling me back. Thanks for holding. Yes, hello? Yeah, hi. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I've got a bummer email that says you guys don't ship to me. Yeah, well, well do you know the laws of uh, Pennsylvania over there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the laws. I mean, I have a tobacco permit and stamp tax and a business license. And what's the problem? 
It's because uh, the state is, is uh, they don't allow uh, they don't allow us to ship there. Yeah. yeah. They must have called like 20 different times trying to contact us. They talked to Paris and emails. In the conversations, it's like you can tell that it's you know. I'm saying no, and the guy's not listening. I got, I got a PA tobacco license. I mean, you know, shit, I got all the right these stations. Shit, two blocks away. Yeah, you know, it's the DEA though. It's like a federal. It's like a federal across the state line. And then he would come back and go, "Oh, I talked to my lawyer. He said that's only like in Pittsburgh, but in my county, in uh, Beaver Falls, it's allowed." So uh, came down to it where he decided that he was going to show up at the warehouse and buy it. I believe he said, I'm going to rent a navigator because you know how I do it. And I was like, OK, yeah, well, you know, as long as you're coming here, they bought everything that we didn't have in stock. So once we filled the order, then they were like, oh, well, we're not in town. You know, just ship it to us. We ended up just finally shipping it because it was just sitting there and it was on hand and we were holding up other orders. So it was probably eight months, the whole thing. Hey, Peter, it's Russell from Shop Hey, Russ, what's going on? Oh, man, how you doing? Good, man. I just, uh, just going through these boxes. I haven't gotten a chance to open them up yet, but... Oh, uh, no way. They, they're there, though. Yeah. Oh, killer. I just want to check to make sure you got everything. Right we got them, brother. This could be it, Harry. Pass the word along. Tell the men it's time to shoot the moon. I couldn't believe the manpower that they had. There was nobody inside, and they, like, stormtrooped the place. 45 agents, as soon as I opened up the door, they pushed me out of the way, and they ransacked the factory. Like, as if somebody was in there waiting to ambush him over glass. And it wasn't like anyone was really hiding anything because everybody was listed with their address. We weren't like a garage operation. We were a company that paid taxes. All they had to do was pick up a phone. We would have told them everything. Because we were wide open. But they wanted to make it look like a criminal enterprise. So they had to do the old raid in the morning. Once they got the one thing they needed, then that whole operation could go forward. We were the last straw, you know? That was the last thing they needed. Throw Tommy in on top of the pile, and now it's on. Where no one, it wouldn't even have made the news if they would have went up to Oregon and shut people down. I was insignificant, you know? I was like, uh... You know, they asked me some questions, but really I was insignificant. It, it, it was like, from, from the get-go, it was clear that they could care less about me. It was about my father and his celebrity. That's what it was about. Make bombs illegal. I know hippies will quit like left and right now. <laughs> I just throw their butt away. I can't smoke anymore. <laughs> I got my ball. <laughs> Truth is, boy, you get a bud, no way to smoke it, you turn into MacGyver in a heartbeat. Took a little jar of pimentos, punched a hole in the top, put a French horn mouthpiece in it, took my brother's super soaker, cut his hose, stuck that in there, went to my neighbor's house, asked my neighbor's mom for some Play-Doh for a Sunday school project, plugged it up, went down to my buddy's house, and uh, it was done. I think the easiest way is to grab an apple, and then you want to create an L. You find where the stem comes out, poke a pen, a big pen that is, right down the bottom. You want to burn it slow and lightly, and you get kind of a natural taste with it, kind of an apple scented weed. It's straight, it works perfectly. Potatoes work too. You can take a mag light and unscrew and put the battery, take the battery out to get rid of all the rubber, and they'll put a screen in there. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can actually in ingest marijuana, but through a bong is a healthy way. Okay, again, this is another item. The gas mask bong. Of course, you would put the gas mask on your face and then ingest the, uh, the marijuana so you can have your hands free. <laughs> the federal government, to my knowledge, has never emphasized uh, headshot cases. This was the first, um, first uh, major prosecution that uh, 
that I can remember. So people tended to, uh, to kind of ignore it. They sort of pulled something up out of the, out of the basement of federal law here and prosecuted Tommy Chong with that, with that uh, federal statute. This railroad train was heading for the station. And one of our problems in this case is that so many people told Tommy that nothing was going to happen to him. And we were afraid that it was. The government believes that the federal statute in this case prohibiting the sale and offering for sale of drug paraphernalia is absolutely clear. This woman in Pittsburgh, she was the national U.S. attorney in charge of the task force on drug paraphernalia. So we knew we had problems. And she came into court personally, argued the sentencing, and it was clear this thing was being done as a show trial, as a show case for her to further her career and for the attorney general to further his career. They spent $12 million and utilized massive law enforcement resources to prosecute this bomb case. It was a shock. In a last-ditch effort to avoid serving actual prison time and stay at home under house arrest, Tommy made a public service announcement for the Drug Courts of America. Tommy's concept, why smoke pot to get high when you can get high naturally dancing salsa? Is this a wide shot? Do you have a headband? Some yep. John? You want to do some, some stuff with the, with the John character talking about salsa? Mm, no. No? No, I think it'd best be me. Uh -huh. yeah, I actually think you should put some humor into some of this. Some, well, that's true. I do. Yeah, you're not that's funny, man. Yeah. You're not funny. No, the humor funny. is good, but I don't think being that character is right. Well, you don't want that because, yeah. you know, my humor, you know, in this situation is definitely not something you were, you're going to be able to show any drug court. <laughs> yeah. Try one more time. Yeah. Action. Yeah. Uh, hey, man, you know who I am. I'm Tommy Chong, man. And I just got to know one thing. Do you want to get high? Cut, cut, cut. Now, isn't it true that Tommy plea bargained and accepted a jail term, as I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, to save his wife and his child? Tommy determined from the outset that he was not going to contest the charges if we could arrange a deal that would assure that neither his son nor his wife were charged. She said, look, it, uh, we're thinking of prosecuting his son, we're thinking of prosecuting his wife. Uh, if your client takes the takes the fall, we won't prosecute them. So it's not really a deal. They didn't say, oh, yeah, you'll get house arrest or you'll get this. It's like, you know, you don't know what you'll get, but we won't prosecute your, your you know, your, your son and your, your wife won't get the same thing, you know, so you have no choice. Almost all federal charges are settled by a plea bargain. The prosecutors have enormous, enormous power uh, in seeking punishment by how to frame the charge and can seek very, very long prison sentences. And as a result, there's enormous pressure on the defendant to plea bargain and plead guilty and get a reduced sentence. I mean, some of these sentences are just too long to serve. So what Tommy did, I don't know. Maybe he could have been found innocent in court, maybe not. But by going to court, it would have been an enormous, enormous risk. The way it is now, this is a slam dunk for all the legal profession. The, the defense lawyers don't have a job. They just rubber stamp any, any, all they have to do is take the deal, whatever the deal's offered, to their client and say, take the deal. If you don't take the deal, you're gonna go away to jail because there's no way you're gonna win. I could speak for hours about how unfair the federal system is. It is run not by judges, it is run by prosecutors and by our elected officials in Washington, D.C. It is a totally unfair system. I feel badly for anybody under federal indictment. Tommy got nine months. Of all 55 defendants, he was the only defendant with no priors to receive actual prison time. What we did was identify every distributor over the internet who supplied these products and we charged every single one of them without exception. But, the but is it true that, that the 54 received, others got less than Tommy got, that Tommy got the most severe sentence of the 55? Of the 55, most defendants did receive a, less, a far less sentence. However, there was someone who was prosecuted just two years ago who received a sentence of two years. 
So that's substantially more than the sentence that Tom Right, but your, an, your answer is that in Operation Pipe Dream, he received the most severe sentence. So far, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so he wouldn't be in And that's okay. It's okay. It's a nice new prison in uh, near Bakersfield. Minimum security because totally minimum. No, it's a no, it's a federal experience. Shaw, Forrest, no phone. Yeah, you got a phone call this morning. Mr. John, you know, like I'm a real big fan of yours, but uh, you have to go to jail October the 8th, 2 o'clock at a place called Taft, uh, somewhere in California. I don't know where that is, either, but it's somewhere in California. A big deal was made out of uh, a couple of interviews that Tommy gave uh, after the guilty plea. Tommy made some remarks which the judge and the prosecution interpreted as undercutting his plea and his statements regarding his remorse. You know, I'm really not allowed to say anything. You think this is over blown out of proportion? <laughs> uh, you know, just the charges speak for themselves, really. The government then pointed to an online chat session sponsored by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, where Tommy was asked, what do you feel about the feds cracking down on glass pipes and bongs? And he replied, I feel pretty sad, but it seems to be the only weapons of mass destruction they found this year. They argued that uh, Tommy became wealthy by glamorizing the illegal distribution and use of marijuana and they cited uh, his film uh, Up in Smoke, which they said trivialized law enforcement efforts to combat marijuana trafficking and use. Um, totally discounting the satirical nature of the film and uh, taking the position that this was somehow or other a, a serious slap at law enforcement. Okay, just be cool. How long you guys been in Mexico? A week. I mean, they did that day. Which one is it, a week or a day? It's a weekday. You got any narcotics or marijuana in here? <coughs> uh, not anymore. What? They, even in the transcripts, they, they said, you know, that I'm in here because I did these movies. Like, it says uh, children are going to be watching these f for decades. I think this whole portion of the government's sentencing memorandum undercuts their statements to us that they were not seeking jail time for Tommy. They would say to the judge, here's a man who has become wealthy, thumbing his nose at marijuana enforcement efforts. The government could only have hoped in pointing that out to inflame the judge and send a message to the judge that here's a man who needs to be taught a lesson and should be incarcerated. That's my personal take on it. The government has admitted that part of the reason for the sentence was the exercise of his First Amendment rights, that is, making humorous films about the drug use, which they claim encouraged people to use drugs, is a plain violation of the spirit of the First Amendment. So you have an equal protection violation, a First Amendment violation, and a needless misuse of criminal resources when easily this could have been done in a civil manner. The idea that anyone would have to serve an extra day in prison because of a comedy routine involving Sergeant Stadenko that's like the worst paranoid Cheech and Chong fantasy from the early 70s come true. Hey, man, look, the house is being raided, man. Get out of the house. It pays. It pays. Vamos. Sounds very Latin. Could be the Mexican connection. Better get this down. This is America. You get to criticize the government in this country. You get to say, I think these guys are ridiculous. It's guaranteed in the very first amendment to the Constitution. It's what this country was founded on. You get to do that by being an American. And the fact that she brought up your movies? The that fact that she brought up our movies means we don't want you to say whatever you want to say. This is not your America anymore, it's our America. You know, and that's absolutely not the case. I think the joke we did in The Tonight Show is that, you know, if Tommy had been a conservative radio talk show host instead of uh, being in movies, he'd be in rehab. See, I think if they want to get you, uh, they get you. One of the most emotional moments along the way for Tommy was when he realized the fight was over. He was going to prison and there was nothing he could do about it. 
It was sobering, you know. It was it was a sobering moment because all the bullshit was over. You know, there was no more pretending. There was no more. Uh, well, we can win this on appeal, or they can't do this to us, or you know, how how could they? I'm just an actor. It was all of that was over. No, it was I was going to jail. I want to make a difference now. That's why our life has been so perfect up until now. You know, really, perfect. Can you imagine I've made a living for years, 30 years, talking about a culture, and now I'm finally going to have to stand up and be coming for it. It's just only right. I think when you look at the willingness punish marijuana offenders this severely, take away their jobs, their cars, their houses, put them in prison for up to life without parole. It's not because of a small number of, of CIA people conspiring. It's because of something very deep in our culture that's willing to punish and destroy the people we don't like and who don't fit and who don't behave the way that we do. I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and my dad, full Chinese, Cantonese, and my mom was uh, Scotch-Irish. And they met in a park in Edmonton, and there was, it was uh, pretty hairy in those days. I grew up knowing I was mixed, I, you know, and there was no doubt about it, and I was definitely not invited into the white race. I remember a 10-year-old, 11-year-old girl having a birthday party on my block, and everybody got invited except me because I was half Chinese. You know? The father did not want uh, to mix, you know, have that little half breed boy there. You know, and these were the people I played with every day. You know, that 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 kind of thing. So growing up in that environment, you know, with all the rednecks and that, we learned to fight. First thing we did, you know, my brother and I. Actually, my brother, he was much better. He was older than me, so he he had to clear the jungle. You know. I always felt second class with white girls, you know, especially the high class white girls, you know, because they'd always be sneaking around to, to, to see me or lying, you know, telling uh, I was Italian or something. <laughs> and then when I started dating black girls, I was like, wow, this is great, you know. I really became a black guy, man. I did. Music, everything. I dressed, talked, tried to talk, but, you know, I, I wasn't very good at. in a band called Bobby Taylor in the Vancouver's. And I wrote a song called Does Your Mama Know About Me? But a, a, a guy asking a woman if her, if her mother knows that he's black, or in my case, Chinese. Even though Tommy created the Vancouver's, he was fired from his own band. But around the same time, a bass player named Ray Vaughn handed Tommy two things that would change his life forever a Lenny Bruce comedy album, and a marijuana cigarette. Lenny Bruce exposed the hypocrisy around marijuana and the laws against it, which had been steeped in racism and used as a tool to keep minorities down. It was the jazz musicians who turned it into a sacrament and passed its cultural use down to the beats and the hippies. <laughs> So much of the war on marijuana is really a war on the 60s. You know, it's a way of enforcing conformity on people. The, the pot laws have very little to do with this plant and everything to do with the people who smoked it. And in the 60s, marijuana was a, was a symbol of rebellion, openly and defiantly a symbol of rebellion. Everybody was smoking pot. Your school teacher was smoking pot. You know, it's like, it was, a, it was a sacrament. So Tommy and Cheech and Chong 
were the voice of all those people, that emerging cultural front, that liked the effects of marijuana better than they liked the effects of nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol. It was a cultural divide. We had a huge spiritual awakening in, in, in the 60s, and they've spent the last 40 years trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and they've been very successful at it. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I think we're on to something really big, Harry. This could be the bust we've been waiting for. I told Peter Fonda this when we talked to him, we were actually going over this issue, and I said, they're out to get us. All of us. <laughs> Just starting with Tommy, because you got that right. I said, so we gotta stick together. And I said, and if they have their way, they will get all of us eventually. <laughs> the catchphrase of the 70s, do your own thing, has been replaced in the 80s by just say no. I went to Oberlin in the 60s and graduated in 69 from Oberlin, so I'm well aware of the whole culture. Tommy Chong is a, is a, is a lot of things, but he's made his cause celebre drugs. And uh, you got to live your life way beyond that. We're past the 60s. What's really remarkable that under this drugs are John Walters, John Ashcroft, the Attorney General of the Bush administration, they've really adopted a new focus in the drug war. And the new focus is marijuana. Marijuana is the culture war for them. It's the way of taking the drug war to middle America. There has been a culture in the United States in which entertainers have portrayed drug use as something that's acceptable and, in fact, desirable. And unfortunately, our youth are influenced by those types of statements. Potheads are so easy. Yeah. I've known potheads to ask cops directions with a joint in their mouth. <laughs> Excuse me, officer. Can you tell me? Never mind. It's not as if the Justice Department sent out a notice to all of these people producing drug paraphernalia, producing bongs and such, and said, we realize that this law has not been enforced by the federal government in recent years, but now we're going to start to enforce it, so cease and desist from your manufacturer. They didn't do that. There was no heads up. There was no notice. Right? What they did was they raided people, they arrested people, middle of the night, humiliated them, seized their property, destroyed their property. This was all about politics, it was all about humiliation. That's what was going on. This was not about protecting the kids, this was not about any of that. Yesterday was September 11th, the day we were supposed to remember what was really important to us in America. And on that day, yesterday, Tommy Chung was sentenced to nine months in federal prison for selling bongs on the internet. Finally, the terror alert can go back to green. Right after 9-11, Ashcroft said, we have to concentrate on a few things that we need to do, most importantly. He made a very, very smart statement that he never lived up to, which was, Look, now that we're confronted with this terrorist problem, you know, we can't really do what we all always did. We, and I, I interpreted that to mean, you know, we can't fight the culture wars, we can't fight the drug wars, we can't fight the war on sex. We gotta fight the terrorists. We can't divert our manpower. Well, obviously, that went out the window because I can't think of a more ridiculous diversion of manpower than to bust Tommy Chung. If anyone feels safer, because Tommy was put in jail, that's a ridiculous human being. They're just tearing this whole Constitution apart. They're tearing uh, freedoms apart. You know, they got this. And then the 9-11 hit, and then that, that gave them the carte blanche. You know, now they can do a Patriot Act on everybody. We've got a new war, and I want you to know your government is doing everything we can to defeat those who hate freedom. It's so important for Americans to know that the traffic in drugs finances the work of terror, sustaining terrorists. And I mean, even, even right now, I read where they equated drug use with terrorism. 
So that's the first step in, in saying that if you use drugs, you can be locked up as a terrorist because you support a terrorist uh, uh, organization. Your use of drugs. The terrorists use drug profits to fund their cells to commit acts of murder. If you quit drugs, you join the fight against terror in America. Time has arrived. I got a little thing I used to do, still do. When I was confront, when I first, when I went back uh, doing comedy, and so I hadn't been on stage for almost ten years when I went back to do comedy again, and I had no act, and so I did this little time thing where I said, I'm going to remember this moment when I had no act, and I'm going to remember this moment ten years from now when I've been on the road for ten years and I, you know, got tons of material because it was a it was sort of like a helpless feeling you know that you're caught in this time warp and so that's kind of how I'm handling this this little trip I'm going on because I want to remember I'm not going to remember you know it's not so much dwelling on the fact that I'm leaving I'm looking forward to the time when I'm coming back that's the time I'm going to be remembering it's funny, Arnold gets, we're going to see if we got, we're going to have a governor named Arnold. I got a feeling we're not. I mean, if, if they elect Arnold, <laughs> I mean, then we really are a, a nation of, of retards. I, I talked to uh, the, pri the prison, Taft Prison finding out what I can bring and everything. Yeah, your glasses. And they these said... Are, these oh, they're old. I think I got a kind of a... Problem. I'm going to throw these out. So what up? Your glasses. What? These ones. These ones. Why? What's embarrassing? You don't need I can them. use them. No, I'm throwing them out. <laughs> honey, don't do that. Don't throw them out. You only get to take one pair to prison, honey. I said, you know, what can I bring in the prison? You give me a list. Uh, I can get a, a gray sweatpants, gray sweatshirt with no hoods, white t-shirt, gray underwear or white underwear, wedding band. And he says, and you can bring prescription drugs provided you have a prescription from the doctor. So I says, well, I got a prescription for marijuana bring that and he goes <laughs> no <laughs> they're pretty nice it's gonna be a nice adventure adventure I'm going on location
I don't know any prison songs. <laughs> yeah? Yep. Better go. Last tango lesson for a while. We got a last, last everything going on now. <laughs> Anybody goes to jail even for an hour and not come out changed. You always have that knowledge that at one time or another you have been humbled. You are humble. That's what it is. You no longer feel invincible and you no longer feel like, oh, that would never happen to me. Once you've been through that that, that walk, you know, once you've done that walk, yeah, you come up changed. You're, you're there, you've been there. Tommy phoned me this morning at, it was like 7.30, and he'd been up since 5, and he's doing really well. It's, it's fine in there, he has a lot of fans. He was there about a week before I got there. And somebody said, uh, I asked when I got over there, I said, I heard uh, Tommy Challenge over here. And he goes, yeah, there he goes. I looked and I said, hell, I thought he was taller than that. <laughs> Steve is my dog. He's, um, he's the guy I walked the track with. And we played bocce ball now. First thing they did with him, they tried to get him to take anger management. He goes, what do I need anger management for? People were saying, man, I bet he's going to be smoking dope over there. Everybody's just going to be smoking. I bet he brings in a bunch of dope. There was a dude that wanted to smoke a joint with Tommy. And I kind of watched Tommy's back when I was in there, you know. That's what dogs do. I looked over, I said, is that dope? He said, yeah. I said, get your ass out of here with that. You stupid. I had some choice words for him. <laughs> there's so many snitches in that place. It's a jail. And I guess uh, the sergeant's next door. He's talking. And these walls are thin. Maybe they got the uh, secret monitors on or something. <laughs> I'm the resident celebrity, so I, I, I spend a lot of time taking pictures with the, with the inmates, which I love. I love. And I get a lot of mail, and I love that, too. I love hearing, hearing the, the CO call my name. Chong. Chong, chong. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah. 
the foolishness of it is, all they did when they did that to Tommy, all they did with the people who follow him, all they did was made more of a hero out of him. That's what they did. So when you do that, when you bring attention to a Tommy Shaw and you bust him for something like that, it's just going to get everybody behind his cause even more. There are people in here that desperately needed a voice, you know? They desperately needed me to be in here so I could be doing exactly this because no one's speaking for them. Because there's so many stories in here. There's so many uh, innocent people that are they're being uh, incarcerated for, for no reason. We gotta move on. You know, my dad's gonna be fine. He's, he's a tough guy, he's in prison, and he's, he's fine, you know? And he can't wait to get out, but you know what? He's fine. And they, they're not going to take anything away. They're just making him bigger and stronger and something serious to reckon with. Because when he gets out, I mean, talk about inspired. I feel tremendously guilty. And I feel, I feel very responsible for, for convincing my parents to, to get into this business. So, you know, I'm gonna do my best to make this up to them, you know? And it's not something that they've instilled in me and said that, you know, you owe us or anything like that. So it's, I don't want that to, to, to sound like that. It's just something that I, that I see, that I've observed and that I want to do for my family, you know? See, there's no set rules because you never know. Like a lot of people say it was wrong for this guy to go to jail, but yet he wrote a great novel while he was in there. You know, because people's experiences, man, how can you say they're right or wrong? You know, it's what people go through what they need to go through in order to, you know, in order to get some use of living on Earth, you know? So how can you make any judgment? I can't. All we can do is, uh, is just be funny. That's all, and make people laugh. Hi there, groovy guys, groovy girls. Welcome to Let's Make a Dope Deal. Hey, Bob, we haven't seen you in five years. What have you been doing? I said, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bob. Bob. <laughs> right. We haven't seen you in five years, Bob. What have you been doing? Five years. <laughs> That's right. We haven't seen you in five years. What have you been doing? I got busted. Five years. <laughs> All right. He's been in jail for five years. I got out yesterday, man. <laughs> All right. And you're ready to play Let's Make a Dope Deal, huh? I want to score some more dope, man. All right. <laughs> Burnt out, huh? <laughs> Hello? Hi, honey. No, we're late. We're just driving in there now. Josh, put the camera away now, okay? Don't, because we can't do anything because I don't want Tommy in any trouble. I do not want them putting him back in here. Anything like that. The last thing we want. Anything like that. Is that, that him? Oh, that's him. That's him. Did you honk? Yeah. Fuck. Don't you dare put that okay, camera okay, up. Okay, okay, Don't you dare to All get right. in trouble. All right. I met a dusky maiden one day With her naughty glance and charming hula dance She made me want to linger and play Naughty hula eyes that slyly hypnotize That cast a spell right from the start Deep within them lies a smile that never dies Thrill and still my heart. Then it I'm trying to register as a narcotics offender at the police station, but I've just been told I have to go downtown and be in line at four in the morning at the Parker Center. <laughs> Oh, 
when you go to jail, when you when, when you end up in jail, when you're in the system, you're in the system. They own your ass. They want people to fail the piss test. That's why they have piss test. And that's why they have these probation periods, you know. It's a game. This government is equipped to handle rebels. You know, that's exactly what they're, these laws were, were designed to do. Yeah, you're free, but not really. This is still a game, no, it's just large. And I'm allowed to go out and work uh, at World Gym <laughs> for, for a minimum wage, which they get 25%. In uh, Nice Dreams, uh, Zabel plays himself in you know, the gym. Cheech and I go in the gym, and, and I bring Zabel a bud. This bud's for you. Wow. Zabel, Zabel taught me how to smoke pot. In the 60s. How, did you really teach him how to smoke pot? How's that? Come on, are you kidding? <laughs> Inhale. He's the master. But we always to smoke together at my place. And I hate to tell you who else was there. <laughs> he wouldn't like it. <laughs> who? Well, we'll give you a hint. He's the governor of he's, California. He's the governor. <laughs> Out of jail. Yeah. You're a free man. Free man. Free at last. But here I am. And I feel different, you know that? I feel, I feel free. When they say doing time, I really understand it now. Because you're, you're messing with time, or time's messing with you. You're finding out what it's like to have uh, your time controlled. <laughs> well, but there's a there's a feeling. There's a well, I feel it. I, I wasn't sure if I would feel it. How does it feel? Like it was all a dream. I believe he's lost his mind. I think he's lost his mind. <laughs> Stoners can be efficient. Uh, uh, what word am I looking for? Hardworking, diligent. Yeah, hardworking, diligent individuals who are very responsible. It, it, it's such a crock. Have you ever met Well, I'm excited. Tommy Chong is on the show. Tommy flew into town last night on the red eye. <laughs> In fact, he brought a clip. It's a roach clip, but he has a clip. <laughs> a water pipe itself is not illegal, is it? No, but if, if it has my face on it, it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did you send it? Because you can um, buy water. You can go to Santa Monica Boulevard and buy a water pipe. It was sent to Pennsylvania, to a little head shop run by the DEA. Okay, they so just... isn't that entrapment? They've ordered, they've, they've <laughs> asked you to send it? Isn't that entrapment? I, yeah, but it, okay. this is America. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> There's no such thing as now, entrapment anymore. And where was the prison? Where'd you get sent? Oh, uh, Taft, okay. uh, California. It's okay. uh, near Bakersfield. Oh, okay. Real nice. In fact, when Real I say nice? hi to all the guys at Taft, they're white. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, man. Well, I, Tommy Chong is 66 now, and the man who, along with his buddy Cheech, parlayed stoner comedy into best-selling albums is on the comeback trail. Comeback because Tommy Chong was released from federal prison in July after spending nine months in a California minimum security facility. Tommy Chong performs tonight and Saturday night at Stanford & Sons Comedy Club in Overland Park. 
and these will be his first stand-up shows in the U.S. since he went to prison. At this point in your life, people hear the names Cheech and Chong, and they think of drug use. What do you make of that at this point in your career? I, I, there again, I, you know, it's more, um, it's a badge of honor that I, I'm very proud to carry, especially now, you know, because I'm, I've been, uh, you know, martyred. <laughs> well, it's kind of weird, you know, especially the guards. <laughs> First time I was in there, the guard's a big fan. He goes, hey, I got all your records. <laughs> Okay, uh, turn around and spread your ass. <laughs> Well, Cheech and I, you know, we we're, were going to do a movie together. We still still might if, uh, if if I can get him to be Cheech again, you know. But he's he changed. He 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 went 180 degrees like like the other way. What do you mean? Well, religious? No, no. Uh, he just doesn't want to be that Chicano character mm. anymore. You know, he he's growing out of the he's growing up. In other words, you know. Because the partner, the, the Cheech that I used to be with is gone. There, he's not there anymore. Kansas City, the home of John Ashcroft. <laughs> That's my buddy, man. Oh, John. <laughs> he hasn't seen the last of me. Needless to say, I want to thank U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Mary Beth Buchanan. That's a, a, a lot of work in behalf of the American people and the children of America. In June 2004, John Ashcroft promoted Mary Beth Buchanan to director of all 94 U.S. attorneys, making her the most powerful federal prosecutor in the nation. And in November, claiming that he had secured the nation from crime and terror, John Ashcroft resigned. When they targeted, when the Justice Department, when Ashcroft, Walters, decided to go after Tommy Chong and the, the bond manufacturers in, in Operation Pipe Dream, maybe it may have been the ultimate symbol of the absurdity and the silliness of the war on drugs. It's a civil rights issue. It's about the power of the government to choose who they don't like and destroy them. And, uh, you know, you can sit quietly by while pot smokers and people like Tommy Chong are in prison and think it has nothing to do with you and then one day it may have something to do with you. I told him after I got to know Tommy, you know, and uh, he told me about his case and stuff, I laughed and told him, uh, you know, you know why you're doing time. And he said, why? Because of the character you played. You were so good, you convinced them all that that's who you are. See, it wasn't like I was in a contest and I had lost. I wasn't defeated by any means. The, the ultimate aim was to bring me down. You know, that's what they wanted. You know, they, wanted to, they wanted that stoner that they saw in the movies, you know, because I represent their worst nightmare. I'm their kids, I'm their grandkids, I'm their total worst nightmare. I wasn't an activist before they put me in jail. But I sat in jail, and I looked around, and I seen what was going on in America. And I tell people now, you know, they say, what was jail like? I said, well, you'll find out. <laughs> you'll find out. Because they can put anybody in jail anytime they want and don't think they won't. Keep awake, be alive, and make sure we vote. Make sure we get everybody out there and vote these fuckers out of office. Thank you. Tommy Chong, ladies and gentlemen. Tommy Chong. Everything in this drama, it was, it was exciting. It was exciting and it was sad. It was, uh, it was all of that. But it's not over. 
See, the fight wasn't over. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I lost, I gotta go to jail and start my life over again. No, it was, uh, what happened is just the beginning. It was like a chapter. Prison time was just another, another round of the fight. He's up in smoke.
pumping full of women because I'm tired of fucking men. <laughs> I'm stuck in falls in prison. <laughs> That's Steve's song. She goes, but he's taking the rap for his son, right? Wow. And I said, ninety uh, one year old Gachi. And I said, well, she, yeah. And I said, well, you know, it's it's more complicated, but that's kind of what it is. And she goes, well, I hope he won't have to do it all the time. But that was the problem. We never. We never really believed it. No. Right. no. Too I know. Son. We never believed it. <laughs> That's called celebrity Shelby. retardation. <laughs> That's what celebrity does to everybody. You become stupid. Because you think it's on the you, you just get so much given to you for, for decades. Well, you know what you're saying. And you, you start to become entitled. And I speak from experience. And then one day, the boom falls. And you're like, oh, what? What? Me? Well, it's the I opposite. Know. It's the opposite with me. It was that... I thought they would let me go because I was famous. The opposite. They need me there because I'm famous. Yeah. That's why I'm going. Oh, yeah. Dad. I, I thought it worked the other way around, you know? <laughs> Watch out, Eminem. When you're 80 years old, we're going to get you. <laughs> How did Dave's not here come up? <laughs> Typical Tommy sadisticness. <laughs> There's a little studio area in the Charlie Chaplin Studios, A&M lot. And so, the screening room, and so I went inside, the, we both went into the screening room, and, and Cheech put on a lot of costumes, you know, he had an overcoat and a hat, and he was gonna go outside, and then he was gonna say that, uh, he's a, like a drug dealer, and you know, he's gonna knock on the door, and I, I was supposed to open the door, and, and you know, let him in, and, and uh, and there's an acting exercise, you know, where you go outside the door and you knock. And I, I never knew about this exercise, but anyway, it was just my instinct, you know. I just, he went outside and I turned on the tape recorder and he knocked on the door and I wasn't looking at the tape recorder, so I wasn't sure if it was recorded or not. So when he knocked, I, I said, who is it? I, I was supposed to kind of knock on the door and the guy said, come in. And, uh, and it was a whole other bit about something, the employment office or something like that. And so I say, hey, man, you know, go dress up in the, the coat and the thing, and the bag and the hat. Okay, just get in the character. Said, okay. So I go out there and I, I go, it's hot, it's, it's boiling. I'm just in this long coat and boom, boom, boom. Who is it? What the fuck? So then I waited, you know, because I looked at the tape recorder and the and needle wasn't moving. Of course, we weren't speaking. And every time we'd speak, I'd look away. So I, I, I you know, wasn't staring at the tape recorder. So I was, when I was looking at the tape recorder, wondering whether or not it was working, Cheech knocked again. And I seen the needle jumping, so I knew it was working. So I said, so I said, oh, we'll start the bit again. So I said, who is it? Uh, so I just kind of got into care. It's, it's Dave, man. And then Tommy's, it, and it was Tommy fucking with me. I said, who? He goes, it's me, Dave, man. Now open up. And then I said, Dave? And he goes, yeah, man, it's Dave. Then I said, Dave's not here. <laughs> and there was this beautiful pause, and all of a sudden he started banging. I'm Dave, man. I'm, no, open the fucking door. And then he went nuts. Yeah, open the fucking, come on, man, it's hot out here. Come on, what are you doing? He finally opens up the door and he's just laughing his ass off. He's just, just tears are rolling out of his eyes. This is what you got. And he's recording this. You wanted to kill him, huh? I, I, I said, you got to hear this. This is the fucking funniest thing. So we play it back and we both started rolling. We were just, it was hilarious. And so I opened the door and he came 
busted in, man. He was so pissed. He's throwing all the costumes at me on the floor. What the fuck you doing out there, man? It's hot. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. I said, listen, listen. So we, we rewound it and we played it back. Now, that was the only time, I swear, the only time, well, a couple of times we, where we just sat and played the thing over and over again and laughed. This laughter sounds sick. We were like the biggest Cheech and Chong fans ever. And then we took it to, around. We played it for everybody. And everybody that heard it just cracked up. Just loved it. And that night, we went in and recorded it for real. You know, And we never we never even came close. It was funny. But we never came close to the original recording, which we couldn't use because, you know, it was that little tape recorder. It was so simple. Just the simple... Thing. But it, it captured everything, the paranoia of the time, the drug culture. And it was just a little slice of life that everybody identified with. Right. And just simple, simple. One chord. And, and so then we actually had to go recreate it in the studio. It was nowhere near ever. And we never got near what it was originally. No. Uh, but it became a, a, an iconic thing, an iconic bit. You know, everybody knew it. What happened to the, uh, to that, to the original? I don't know, it was on a little cassette, you know, we got lost somewhere in the process, you know. Oh man, that was so funny. Where is that original recording? <clears throat> Gone. That was 30, oh, about, what, 37 years ago? 